I'm a, my name is Dan Richter. I'm from Duke University. And uh, I want, want to note that after praising Dickinson State, that one of our 10 sponsors is Duke's Food Policy Center. Pretty good. Uh, I'm a podologist. I haven't, I haven't heard that word this morning, or this today, today, pedologist. And that means a person who studies how soils form naturally, how, natural, how this natural planet forms its remarkable soil. I'm worried about my venerable science because I think it's obviously becoming, or risks becoming, risks becoming irrelevant. So I've become an anthropodologist and I'm serious, it's, and it's important, because like it or not, soil is today being transformed into a human natural system. So in, as a pedologist, you study how the human being is a soil disturbing agent. Okay, we can be farmers, but we're basically disturbing agents. As an anthropodologist, our task is to both conceive philosophically and study how soil, how, how we can, how people can become soil forming agents. And that's, in my mind, that's what today is about, is thinking about this connection between soil health and human health, which is a topic a lot of us have, have thought about in the soils community for a long time, and there's just not been that obvious bridge. And now we get this great conference with all this enthusiasm. It's absolutely wonderful. Well, today, I want to argue that we might want to prioritize those things that we can get ourselves into. And I'd like to argue that one of, that some of the, let's say, some of the lowest hanging fruit that are out there for this incredible field of soil and human health is to redouble our ongoing studies like Harold Milkey is doing, who we will hear from tomorrow. Harold is, has been studying over his lifetime uh, an under-publicized crisis of urban lead toxicity. So thus, Eric told us this morning that lead is likely the oldest Soil, human, contaminant, and yet so ironic that lead continues today to impair far too many. Harold, it's got to be in the hundreds of thousands of American kids in America. And then to think about this problem internationally, it's remarkable because America was one of the first countries to take lead out of lead-based paint, to take lead out of gasoline. Mexico went through that transition in the 1990s. So in this first slide, I'd just like to say, depending on the community, when I read literature from Harold and many of his other colleagues, so communities with healthy soils, far less than 1% of kids have elevated lead. And yet there are communities today in America where, you know, depending on the, on the limit, we, we can have communities with 10% of, of kids with exposed to potentially toxic lead in amounts that can impair cognition, behavior, and physical health, and mainly that vector comes from the soil. Despite lead in soil being a major agent for lead exposure, urban soil research continues to be a frontier and to be dwarfed by the medical information we know about this problem. So interesting that the, the medical researchers are more and more turning to lead, how, it's, how it can be transported in particles, breathed, contacted, exposed to people. And yet we know we have very few soil maps of lead in cities. There's some great examples, though. So soil lead spatial distribution within and between communities. What an important thing to learn about. Soil lead toxicity attenuation over the decades, because as I'll show you in a second, there is some good news here. 
best management practices. Why don't we earnestly study best management practices to alleviate future exposures to lead? So a couple of pieces of data. <clears throat> On the left, show you lead usage and its removal from paint and gas, and this is from the USA. Um, we can be impressed with our, with our removals of lead from lead-based paint and from gasoline. These were amazing struggles. Right from the beginning, it was a struggle whether or not to put lead into gasoline. Incredible environmental history study. But finally, we did pull them out. But what I'd say is important about the left-hand gra graph is that although we can take credit for pulling it out, we didn't understand the soil. The soil is nothing if not a memory. Soil is an archive, a repository of the past. In other words, soils are particles whose surfaces strongly absorb past inputs of lead from paint and gasoline. The map on the right shows Indianapolis. It's a 20-year-old study. Still, maps of soil lead are relatively rare. And it just superimposes uh, neighborhood soil lead concentrations. And in the 1990s, kids who had greater than 10 micrograms per liter, deciliter, excuse me, of lead in their blood, which has now been reduced to five, So when I think about the challenge that the Soil Lead Institute and company uh, charged us with, uh, I, I think in terms of this, how, how, do we, how do we promote urban soil lead research? And I'd say with notable exceptions, New York City, Baltimore, New Orleans, Indianapolis, urban soil science is an exciting frontier of science. It's so, so ironic. In our backyards are where the frontier is, our front street steps. And nearly all soil science uh, is based on soil of urban, rural landscapes. And to, to complement the vast and wonderful and detailed and scary medical research of lead toxicity, we can promote research in three areas, I think, and probably many more. Urban soil mapping, studies to quantify exposure risks and attenuation of soil lead toxicity as paint removal and gas removal of lead get further and further into the past. Blood lead concentrations are going down. The trend is definitely good. And finally, soil lead BMPs for reducing risks to soil lead exposure. And last, I, this, this is the slide we were all told to, to kind of dream and and watching other people uh, give the same slide. Um, I, I, I think down there at five to 10 year project, why don't we have a soil health, human health program that doesn't have an end date, <laughs> that simply has competitive, is a competitive program in, in the, you know, we, we, so many of us have said in the tens of millions of dollars, why not hundreds of millions of dollars? I mean, space, military, and human health are the three big research funding sinks for the federal government. The, the environment is so small. So why don't we X out what I've said there and, and don't, don't take out the five and 10 years and think in terms of longer term than that? Uh, because it'll be, this will be a continual need for sure. So I think in terms of regional projects for this soil map, Mapping exercise is one of the things we do. I don't think there's a city in North Carolina with a soil lead map. I've, for, I've been pestering people for that kind of information. Um, and beyond soil scientists, this, this is another in, great interdisciplinary opportunity. Let me include public historians that belong here too. Uh, the National Soil Survey Center, tremendously underfunded part of NRCS, they could be given a new charge. And this is just the beginning. And of course, I've targeted lead, but we could archive our samples and go back to them, uh, those samples for contaminants in general. 
I'm using lead as a good example, as, a play, as something we can do and accomplish. So there's a long list of people that, that ought to be, uh, agencies that ought to be uh, able to support this. So I, I appreciate the initiation of the Soil Lead Institute. <laughs> yes, thank you.